Hello, welcome to the next talk. Uh, next talk will be in English from Fabian Marquardt. Uh, he is working at the University of Bonn, as you can see at this slide here. <laughs> the small corner of the building. <laughs> but not from computer science, I think. No? Um, I'm from computer science, no, but, but this, this is building the main is, building. Yeah, right, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Okay, yeah, the talk is about uh, using container technology for science uh, and teaching uh, and I'm very uh, curious to come to know how we can use these tools. Okay, it's your stage. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, if we are talking about this one, maybe an anecdote. So this is actually the explanation for the new logo of the university, which was introduced last year. So if you think about what should that mean, nobody does understand. You can see this and, yeah. well, no further comment. So um, before I begin, um, a, a few facts about me. Um, I studied uh, computer science at the University of Bonn from 2008 finished uh, 2015, and since then I'm active within the uh, Department of Computer Science as a researcher and PhD student, and my focus area is networks and IT security. So today my talk is mainly from perspective of a computer scientist, and I guess that at least some people in the room are maybe familiar with uh, this perspective, but uh, maybe it's also relevant for other areas, uh, at least of... of um, mathematics, physics, or something like that. That's also uh, areas where you use a lot of computers, you do a lot of programming and stuff, so that might also be interesting. But my perspective, of course, is the perspective of a computer scientist. Um, I love to use open source software, both at work and in my free time. It helps me a lot to, to do a lot of uh, things at work that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So that's also why I'm here today to, to talk about why, how we use uh, this software at the university and how it helps us. And I have been using Docker for some years now, so I'm quite familiar with Docker, but only recently started cu uh, using Kubernetes. And uh, so I want to emphasize that I am by no means an expert in this area. So I'm standing here today rather as a user who is learning by doing, who is trying to, to find something that can help us in certain use cases. Um, there might be some people in the room who, who have far more knowledge about the technical details of Docker, of Kubernetes. Um, that's, um, that's totally fine, and maybe we can get into some discussion uh, later on. If you, if you have some ideas, I'm very happy to receive uh, feedback. But I want to talk mainly today about what are our use cases, how can, us, how can tools like Docker and Kubernetes help us in these use cases, and how do we do that? All right. So a quick overview of the contents of my talk. Um, so Docker and Kubernetes in a nutshell, only very short, um, some exemplary details. Uh, what, what, uh, what is the, the idea of these uh, tools? Um, then I want to talk about what use cases we have in the science and research area, what use cases we have in the teaching area. So how can we make use of those tools at the university? Then I will uh, talk about um, some uh, aspects, at least, of uh, how we implement such a cluster with the respect to the use cases. And uh, obviously, you could talk, for that, uh, talk about that for hours. That um, time I do not have today, so I will focus on some things that I think are especially important and somewhat different to a cluster, for example, that would be used by a software a development company, for example. Um, and obviously, there are some problems. Oh. Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
test, test. All right, so we will continue with this microphone. Um, yeah, where was I? I was talking about problems and lessons learned that I want to talk to you about uh, later on. And then obviously there's a conclusion and outlook. All right, um, so Docker and Kubernetes, what is it all about? Uh, so I was looking into the talks of last year here at FrostCon and there were at least five talks which had Kubernetes and Docker in the name, maybe even more and I missed them. Um, so it has been a, a popular topic, obviously. So maybe we can get a quick raise of hands. Who has at least some basic knowledge about Docker already? Oh, a lot of people. All right, that's good. And who has at least some basic knowledge about Kubernetes? Uh, a few less, okay, but also quite a lot of people. All right. Um, so I keep the part related to Docker very short because it was almost all the people. So one very basic idea that I find is, is very important to understand how you, you do things with Docker is that you ship applications as container images, right? So for most of you people, it is not a new thing that you um, just, uh, with Docker, you don't only give out a binary or something like that, but instead you build an image which contains all the application code, the libraries, the tools, the configuration, which may later obviously be, be overridden by your user-specific configuration, but basically everything you need to run this, um, uh, to, to run some specific software is inside an image. And you can hand out this image and just tell somebody, yeah, if you have Docker, you can run it. Uh, each container obviously runs in an isolated environment, which provides uh, some security, obviously, and also isolation, so that, for example, a, a mistake that you made in one application cannot influence the other one, well, theoretically. And obviously, we don't always want perfect isolation, but uh, in, in many cases, we want our containers to communicate, and so we have inter-container networking. We could, for example, build a situation where we have a HTTP front-end, which is then connected to a container with a web application, and this web application may talk to some database container, and so on and so on. Okay, now, on top of that, we get Kubernetes. Um, I copied a bit of, of the Wikipedia definition. Uh, Kubernetes is an open source uh, container orchestration system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. So that, only, uh, th that already carries a lot of information about what the, the basic idea of, of Kubernetes is. Uh, and basically, you, you build a cluster of at least one master node and multiple worker nodes. And um, the, the very central idea is that the user declares the desired state of the cluster via some configuration syntax. And um, then Kubernetes, the, the control plane, takes actions to ensure that the current state of the cluster matches this desired state. And um, that inclu includes, for example, ensuring that containers are running and working correctly. So for example, that some service is reachable and responding in the right way. Uh, balancing, balancing the load between the cluster nodes, and yeah, basically taking action whenever an error occurs. So when a, a pod crashes, then restart a new pod, for example, right? So that's uh, what, what Kubernetes can give you. Obviously a lot more, but, but I think that's the, the, the most important part. Okay, let's talk about some use cases, how we can, use, how we can make use of these technologies at the university. And let's talk a bit about history. <laughs> Okay, I, I tried to, to do this in a more or less generic way because we could talk about different examples for hours and I, I tried to, to bring this down to, to some generic uh, things that occur multiple times. Um, so looking at science and research, a frequent use case could be some um, colleague of, of me coming to the technician and saying, hey, I have a research project and I have written some tool which analyzes data and now I need to run it um, uh, for a month maybe or, or longer uh, in order to process some data. And so, well, th this happens a lot. It's basically what we do. We try to find out new things and uh, in order to do so, we often require uh, custom-made software to, to, to do this. And so this software by design is, is typically a specialized software, which is written exactly for this uh, specific use case. And this software tends to have strange and uncommon dependencies. Obviously, 
you sometimes have very specific tools and, and SDKs that some other researchers, for example, have written and that are not easy to, to install. So you won't uh, just up get install something and it works. Uh, I, I have had situations where you sit an entire day in front of your computer and in the end of the day you are happy that you can compile some code, right? So that's quite typical. And uh, this software also um, has very frequent changes, at least at the beginning, because when you finish the first version of your tool and you run it with, let's say, a bunch of data, then in the end you look at the results and you maybe see, well, the results look none like I expected. And then you find some bug and you fix the bug and then you run it all again and so on and so on. So you have frequent changes and especially um, if it is difficult to compile it and to run it, then obviously you have um, a lot of, lot of time spent on, on doing just these uh, changes. The time frame is often unclear. In the beginning you might just say, okay, I have uh, some data and I will need it for some weeks and then you find out, well, it's, it's uh, more problematic than we think. We need months or years to, to do it. That can, can totally happen. And also very typical for such software is that it is not used anymore once the project is completed because as scientists we want to write papers or, or we should write papers at least. And so uh, in the end, if, if the software can prove that it works, then we write a paper. And yeah, it's, it's, it's somewhat sad that this happens a lot, but it happens a lot. Okay, let's uh, look a bit into the past. The so solution to, to this use case not so long ago was that the technician would go um, to a storage room and just come back with a computer, like a normal desktop computer, and just give the person the computer and say, okay, here's your computer, install all your stuff, run your stuff, we put it in our server room, which was actually, uh, well, you have uh, an, uh, some shelves and uh, Ethernet cables and power cables, and then you have a lot of computers standing in there doing all sorts of magic stuff. You don't know what they are doing because nobody has an overview of what is even happening. And yeah, obviously this is a massive waste of resources. Uh, you um, cannot have a real monitoring or maintenance. At least it's very difficult because everybody would choose their own Linux distribution, their own uh, uh, packet manager and what, what not, right? Um, and this also leads to situations where you encounter a computer which has a 10-year-old Linux system with no security updates and stuff like that. And I don't need to tell you why this is a problem, I guess. Um, and also computers tend to get lost. So I was talking to colleagues and say, hey, you have this computer in our server room. Oh, this computer? I stopped using it four years ago or something like that. Yeah. And it was still running. And obviously it was not updated or something like that. So again, the security updates, no, it's, it's, it's not done. So this is obviously not good. So solution until now um, is we move away, away from, from uh, physical machines and use VMs. Because everything is better when you have virtualization, right? So. So the technician would just uh, set up a VM um, and give an SSH login to, to the users, to the researchers who want to use it, and say, yeah, have fun, install all your stuff, and, and go ahead. So the improvements is that you have somewhat easier management. You can easily see how um, things are going, which machines are running, and so on. And you have some sort of common base system, so you might just install all VMs with a one um, Linux distribution and uh, then you can enable automated updates and stuff like that to have at least some sort of, of, of uh, well, uh, um, at least a, a basic system which is uh, managed in, in, a, in a proper way. But still, we are wasting a lot of resources because a lot of the VMs tend to just idle and block the RAM and, and stuff, right? So obviously there are methods to improve this, but uh, well, if you, if you just allocate all the memory and not care about if it is used or not, then you, you're wasting resources. Still, you don't have any comp uh, comprehensive maintenance and monitoring, so that's obviously a problem. And also, VMs are not deleted when project is finished. It's the same problem as before. And again, no updates, no security patches. So what would be a better solution? Um, the technician could just say to the people, yeah, just uh, build a Docker image and we deploy it to our container platform. 
Um, the improvement, obviously, is uh, that we can use resources very efficiently um, because uh, if we just containerize our applications, um, then we can um, use the, the RAM. Well, if, if the application is just using one gigabyte of RAM, um, then you don't need to, to reserve, well, let's say, four gigabytes of RAM, and part of that is never used, for example, so you use the resources more efficiently. Um, the admin, at least, has no problems with complex dependencies and installation procedures because the admin only receives the uh, ready-made Docker images, right? Like, uh, build ones run everywhere. That's a slogan I once encountered. Uh, obviously, for, for the researchers, they need to build this image, right? So they need to, to do this. Um, if, if you know Docker, you know Docker files specify how the images get built. And so the researchers need to do this. But also for the researchers, it's a one-time work they need to do, and then maybe they need to update parts of their Docker files, but um, the rebuild of the image to, to build a new version, to, to build in new dependencies uh, is much easier if you have once um, defined a Docker file, right? I, I, I think most of you, if you use Docker, uh, think that is a very cool thing that you have with a Docker file, you have a standard build environment and you can do it again and again. Okay, the, the problems obviously is, um, is researchers still um, need to know how to use it. So if you have a department with, let's say, 10 people and only two people are using Docker and you enforce them to, to use uh, uh, Docker and, and the eight people are, are unhappy and don't want to, to work anymore, then obviously you, you gain nothing. So you need to make sure that at least uh, a significant fraction of your colleagues is interested in using such stuff, which is heavily the case uh, in our department, but it might not be all the time. So before you implement something like this, you, you need to talk to the people and say, what do you want? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to use? Which tools, which systems? And you cannot simply assume that people will be happy with it. And also for, for Docker, we can not say that it is inherently secure because Docker has a real big problem with outdated images which contain dependencies which are like years old. And so uh, security issues are not solved by design. You need to make sure that images, for example, get rebuilt um, in, in proper time schedules. And um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a problem for Docker as a whole and um, it, it applies here as well. All right, so let's look at, at the different use case. Uh, we might also use uh, this in our labs and also in lectures, also, also in teaching in general. Um, so a use case might be we giving an assignment to students, write a program that solves uh, some problem and show us that it works uh, so you get, for example, the exam admission or whatever. So the requirements or needs that we have in this case are basically two things. The students should be given enough freedom in order to realize their own ideas, to try some new stuff, because that's what we really want. We want people to, um, to make use of new technologies, like new programming languages or stuff like that. And um, yeah, if we constrain people too much, then they will not learn anything. But for us, on the other side, and this might feel so, uh, in some way contradicting, it must be easy to check whether a solution uh, is working and complete. So uh, we have to make sure that uh, the students really did this and the students delivered a, a correct solution. And so we need to check this. And so that might seem that we do not uh, want to, to have so much diversity in these solutions. And in fact, the typical solution so far, again, a bit of history lesson here, was that we Right on the, on the assignment sheet, you have to use programming language X and uh, some IDE, maybe Eclipse or whatnot, um, to write your program. The solution must adhere to this and that constraint. So we basically were specifying a lot uh, conditions that students had to adhere to in order to, to deliver a valid solution. Obviously, this is very much limiting the freedom of students, uh, trying out new programming languages, using their own tools, and in general, thinking outside the box. I think for, for me, my motivation as a researcher and also in teaching is that I want to enable people to really learn to try out new stuff, learn themselves, especially in computer science. I think it's very important to, to go ahead and just try stuff and to learn new stuff. And if people come there and say, you need to use this and that, and you cannot use 
all the other variants. I think it's, it's a bad idea. And um, often, well, the students will still, if, if, you, if you give a lot of constraints, students will still deliver solutions that require a lot of manual work. So, for example, the code does not compile, you need some more dependencies which were not listed, and yeah, whatever. So, even if you give, give a, a very specific um, description of what you want to have, students will maybe not deliver this. So, how do we solve this? What we do right now, so this is what we already do, is that we tell people you need to provide with your solution a configuration for some continuous integration tool. Specifically, we use GitLab CI, but you can use any system. And this CI configuration should compile your code, run your code, run certain tests maybe, and this obviously depends on the exercise, but this is a um, generic idea. So students can choose their own programming languages and tools. Uh, in GitLab CI, for example, you can make use of Docker images and your build runs completely in the Docker image. So you can use a Ubuntu image, you can use uh, image which has already Python or whatever programming language support in there. So yeah, that's, that's totally possible. And it is a responsibility of the students to make sure that the code compiles and runs within the CI system. So no more manual work and saying, oh, I have to install this and that on my computer in order to, to validate if the code is, is running completely. Uh, the students have to make sure they will get the CI output, they will see there is an error, they need to correct it. And we might even, that's not something we do right now, we might even supply unit and integration tests to do automated checks, uh, to, to check, for example, if the solution calculates the correct values. Um, that's something we might do in the future. So you can do a lot of things with that. And this is a perfect example. GitLab CI will run the build jobs in Docker containers, and uh, you basically can deploy it. Um, it, it. It runs great. You don't need to to invest much time into getting it to work. And you get very, very much improvement. The students are very happy doing this. So I had a talk to some of the students who, who did these practical exercises uh, in this semester, and they were, uh, they were very happy with uh, the new style of how we did this. All right, so let's look at some parts, at least, of how to implement this. Like I said in the beginning, we could talk about how to implement a Kubernetes cluster for hours. And this is not the focus here today. The focus is that I want to tell you how this is useful for us as researchers in the university. But I want to highlight some points, at least, where I think um, things are getting interesting and you need to consider what you do, how you do it. And we will look at some of these examples. So let's start very basic. The, the initial installation of such a cluster is actually very easy. So you can de deploy it directly to a physical machine. You can also use a VM if you want, but you don't need to. And uh, personally, we use a, um, or, or at university, we use a Ubuntu LTS server image because that's mainly what we use all the time. It's, uh, it's a de facto standard. And um, this has already, uh, there are up repositories available from Docker, from Kubernetes, which you can link to the installation and just install the packages uh, to your system. So the installation of, of, um, of one computer with the standard Ubuntu system and then installing Docker and Kubernetes is done basically in under one hour. And um, one, one very interesting point here that I included is you need to disable the swap space because Kubernetes for some reason is very angry when you enable swap. Uh, so maybe the people in the room who have more in-depth technical knowledge about Kubernetes can, can tell you afterwards why this is the case. Um, we just disabled the swap space. I think it has something to do with the scheduling and resource constraints. Um, but yeah, maybe afterwards we can talk about details. I just included this because that was a problem where we ran into. It wasn't working. We were saying, why, why isn't it working? And then the, the simple answer was, you need to disable swap. <laughs> And, and really bootstrapping the cluster, the Kubernetes cluster, is as simple as uh, on the master node you run kubeadm init, and then on the worker nodes you run a kubeadm join with the address and the token of the master, and then your cluster is basically up and running within some minutes. You need to do nothing more. That's everything you need to do to get a basic cluster. So that's interesting. So the start is very easy. Later on we will see it, is, it doesn't stay that easy. <laughs> 
So what you get basically then, just to, to give you an uh, impression, you have the kernel, you have some OS services that should ideally not be taking much resources away from the system. And then basically what you get is a kubelet, which is what, yeah, you could describe it as the management daemon of the Kubernetes node. And this uh, kubelet schedules and controls the pods. And the pod is basically, if you know Docker, but not Kubernetes, is basically an abstraction of a running container. And so, so basically your, your system, so from, from the perspective of the host system, it's very easy. So, the beginning was easy, but now we're getting to the interesting points. Very quickly, we, re we realized that we would need some persistent storage. We would uh, save some data, for example, which uh, was produced by some analysis tool, or we need a database or something like that. All of that needs persistent storage. In a multi-node cluster, this is obviously not as trivial as for a single node Docker host. If you're used to uh, Docker, then you know you can just map some part of the file system to uh, your container. You can create volumes and stuff, and it's really it's, it's a piece of cake, right? You can, you can do it right away. You don't need to configure anything. It just works. Uh, for a multi-node cluster, obviously, it can't be this easy, because if your application runs on the one computer and the uh, storage is maybe on a different computer, you need some sort of network of, of distributed storage. And what Kubernetes does here, just to give you an impression what you can do, is you have um, multiple storage plugins, basically. So they support the typical cloud providers like Google and Amazon and Microsoft. So if you want to store your data with the NSA, you can do so. Uh, we don't want to do that. Um, as we, we want to do, store our data um, on our machines, and there are some notable open source solutions. This is obviously not complete. Um, GlusterFS, you may have heard about this, or Ceph is a very prominent and, and um, very mature solution to doing distributed storage. Also, there's Flocker. And for the people who basically say, I don't want any fancy service, I just want network uh, accessible storage, you know you have the good old NFS. And it also just works. We're, we're not using NFS right now, but uh, I, th I think it, it will be not so difficult to, to integrate NFS. So what we quickly learned is if you want to do this properly, if you want to do proper distributed storage, which also is somewhat fail-safe, so for example, if one node fails, it just should run um, and, and not, or not break, um, you need to think a lot what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve before you actually get going, right? If you just say, okay, it's, it's just like Docker, I map some volumes, no, it's not the case. You need to think about what you want, you need to plan ahead. And uh, basically, we are currently using Ceph, and uh, as, as I said, Ceph is a very mature solution for, for distributed storage. You can do uh, replication and stuff. Um, but this talk is not about Ceph, so um, it, it can, as you see, work with several plugins, so you can just pick your own solution, but uh, this is not any more trivial. You need to um, look what you are doing before you run into problems. And one very central point regarding the implementation of such a cluster that I want to talk about is multi-tenancy. What does it mean? So typically, a cluster would be used by only one group of users and serves only one specific purpose. So for example, one um, development company, uh, software development company has a cluster where they run their web applications of their customers, for example. And um, for, for us, it's clearly not the case. We have different users of different user groups. We have different researchers, which are part of different projects. We have students from different courses, and uh, we have student assistants, and so on and so on. So uh, we have a multitude of different users, and we also have very different use cases, which we have already seen. And so we need a multi-tenant cluster, which is basically saying that we need a cluster that can adhere to different users and different use cases. And for such a cluster, there is some things that might seem trivial in the beginning, but that are not so trivial to achieve. Um, for once, we want to ensure that the stability of the cluster cannot be compromised by just one user. For example, one user could, um, could work on their own stuff, and maybe their own stuff would break and crash, uh, 
but it should not lead to the complete cluster crashing and not being available, for example. That is obviously a requirement that we have. And also we, we want to have a, a very strict privilege separation. So for example, the admin can maybe do everything. The researchers have control over some area of the cluster and the students only have access to a very specific project within the cluster and they should not be able to see or influence any of the other parts. The same holds true for data privacy. It's basically somewhat related to privilege separation. So users should not be able to access any data that they um, don't uh, that they they um, don't belong to. So, so, for example, if you have a project which uh, anal analyzes some data and maybe this data is uh, somewhat confidential, then another user should not be able to see this data. Right. So that's easy said, but not so easy implemented. Then quotas, obviously, you want, for example, to say it uh, for, for some user um, uh, to not exceed a certain CPU or memory or a disk limit. And um, yeah, this is, this is obviously uh, required as well for, for having a cluster that is not overloaded because one user just decided to run 100 replicas of something. <laughs> so multi-tenancy, how do we get there? So one concept that is already part of Kubernetes is very important here, and this is namespaces. So in Kubernetes, you can assign the pods and all the other configuration to different namespaces. That does not mean that these pods um, are running on different computers. That is a logical separation, right? And so these namespaces could, for example, be the namespace of a research project and two namespaces of some different student projects, for example. And this is, in my eyes, one of the biggest advantages that Kubernetes provides over just using plain Docker. Right? This is what I always missed in Docker, that I could just say, OK, this user, I want to create a user, and this user can only control this and that uh, container, for example. I always miss that. I know it is somewhat uh, in Docker Enterprise Edition, but at least in the open source community edition, you cannot do something like that. Or at least you couldn't do it some months ago. If there is something new, I'm happy to hear about it. And um, so we have this namespaces. How do we actually assign which users can access the namespaces? We have role-based access control, or RBAC in short. And for example, we could say we have some users from a research project which can control the whole namespace. And then maybe um, uh, one student and a different student who can respectively um, access their namespace. And now we have the microphone is gone. So not working anymore. Hello, hello, test, hello. Yeah, OK. Um, and for example, the supervisor of those students could access both namespaces. Yeah, you can, you can basically have a very fine-grained control over which resources are available to which user using the Kubernetes role-based access control. And you can also assign um, the, the roles not only for a complete namespace, but also for different parts of, of a namespace. And for, for within the namespace, you can tell the user, for example, can read how the configuration is, but not overwrite the configuration. So you can do a lot of stuff with the role-based access control. So resource quotas. First of all, before, before we talk about actual quotas, there exists a lot of tools for Kubernetes to monitor the resource usage because this is a very prominent thing. You want to know what is going on in your cluster. Kubernetes um, can be um, can put out some metrics which can then be read by uh, Prometheus, InfluxDB, and all the other solutions that provide some sort of time value database. And then you can cre create, for example, some fancy Grafana dashboards if you are used to that. And uh, so you, it's, it's really easy to, to, to do a proper monitoring of, of such a cluster and also monitor, for example, how much CPU does, the, uh, does each uh, namespace use and so on. You can do it uh, very easily. And uh, that helps us to realize some sort of fair use resource sharing, which is typically for us what we want in like 90% of the cases. Because we don't want to enforce any certain limit on the users as long as the cluster as a whole is not overloaded. 
So if some people need the computation power for some time, they can use it. And then maybe they don't need it anymore and some other people need it, uh, that's totally fine. Um, but if we have a proper monitoring, we would, for example, see, well, now the user is clearly using too much and the cluster is overloaded. And then we could basically just go to the colleague and talk to him, hey, your, your uh, application is using too much resources. Can you reduce it a bit? Can you delete some replicas, for example? And then uh, we just resolve it. So that would typically just be what we want. But in some cases, you want strict limits and then you can have the resource quotas, which are supported by Kubernetes, and you can define them per namespace. So if we go back to the, to the uh, previous slide, you can set for each namespace different quotas. So for example, the student namespace is maybe quite restricted and the research project might just have not any specific quota, but instead use some sort of fair use resource, uh, resource sharing. And uh, what is also quite nice, you can define priorities. So you can say if the cluster resources at one point are overloaded, then this service should have priority over other services, for example. So this is a very important point regarding also the multi-tenancy, which we talked about, that we can um, differentiate which user groups can access how much of the resources of the cluster. All right. Let's go to some problems and lessons learned. So obviously, there are the famous layers of abstraction. Some people may know this comic. Um, so um, basically, in, uh, to, to, to uh, summarize it, it's about uh, some person who wants to um, implement an application which just shows by side by side two, two uh, web pages. And um, instead of using the SDK and doing all the complicated stuff, uh, the person realizes you can just glue together two smaller phones, right? So, so it does the same job. Um, and then but, uh, the other person responds, you never learned to write software. <laughs> no, I just learned to how to glue together stuff that I don't understand. <laughs> yeah? That's basically what uh, Docker and Kubernetes sometimes at least is about. And that can be a problem. And especially it can be a problem when you depend on services running properly in a production environment. Um, so Docker already hides a lot of the details. So in, there is a lot of applications where you go to the website and uh, look for documentation of the installation that nowadays just say, yeah, start the Docker container. You'll be fine. And in most cases, it does work, right? So you're happy. And you don't even look what's inside the container image or whatever. Right, and um, so you already have a lot of abstraction with with Docker, and then Kubernetes comes and adds some abstraction on top of this about how our containers started and stopped and where are they scheduled. You don't know. You usually you don't want to know. And then there's Helm. Um, I don't talk. Uh, I didn't talk about Helm before. Basically, it's a tool which automatically deploys stuff to Kubernetes without you needing to configure stuff which is one more layer of abstraction, right? Um, it's a very uh, nice tool if you just want to get something going, but it comes down to this. It's great as long as it works, but it's really difficult to resolve problems because you just don't understand what's really going on inside of this stack of, of technologies. So my goal always is to try to understand at least on a, on a basic level how things work and to, to see what, what images are they using, how are they doing their services inside the image, uh, how can I access the log files, for example, so that I'm at least prepared, if something goes wrong, to, to know how and where to look uh, for, for uh, an idea how to resolve the problem. And this can be quite difficult at times. And I would really recommend if you plan to, to uh, use Docker and Kubernetes um, on, a, on a production uh, level, and is, this is really not limited to using it at the university. You can also say that for any other production use, that you always should simulate typical problems, node failure, downtime of a service, and so on, before they happen in production. 
Because when they hit them in production, there's people standing behind you, it's not working, make that it works again. And you really don't have um, any time to find out what the problem is. So you should really try to simulate such problems. You can just shut down a node and see what happens, and then uh, look what, 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 how, you, how you can resolve this problem. Basically, that's, that's always a good advice. The second thing, and this is somewhat specific to university, I think it's also applying to, to other areas as well, so you should always document stuff. I think it's in general a good idea, but I will tell you why it's especially interesting for university. So let's, let's start at the beginning. Uh, obviously, your configuration, your scripts, etc., they should be organized in a proper way, because otherwise if they just sit on some hard disk of some laptop of a researcher, then you can't even access it if something goes wrong. So first thing is to organize this in a proper way. Git repositories might be useful, but you can use different technologies. Um, that's what we do. We, we just put every YAML file and scripts uh, in, in, in a Git repository or in different Git repositories, and uh, it works quite well. Uh, the configuration alone is worthless if you um, require a lot of time to understand it, if it is difficult to understand what's going on. So um, configuration alone is uh, helping you to set up the same thing again, but for example, if there is some problem, you need to change something, you want to understand why is it configured this way, and you need some proper documentation. So, um, and what's, what's um, counting towards this problem at university is that students and researchers typically stay at the university for some years, but not longer, right? There are some people who would stay at the university for a very long time, but typically people study for some years and then maybe they uh, do a PhD and stay for the, some years, but then they are gone. And they take away the knowledge and the knowledge is lost, basically, if it is not documented in a proper way. So the goal here is um, to document everything properly so that it is easy to understand for other people what you did. And um, so it is, in the best case, even understandable if you're not even there anymore. That should be the goal. And one example how to do this and how we do it in uh, particular is we put inside our Git repositories where also our configuration lives, we put a readme markdown file or even several files uh, which explains, for example, why is the configuration value set to this and that, or uh, how do you execute the script, which script does what. Um, and so, for example, if you need to, to set up a new node, you have a script which does essentially some, some points that you need to do all the time, and you can just look in the documentation and see what are the steps which this uh, script does. And so this is very important, especially in a situation where you have this loss of knowledge if you don't preserve it in a proper way. But I think it, it applies also to other areas as well, but in universities it's uh, especially important. All right, it already brings us to the conclusion and somewhat outlook. Um, so I have shown to you that many use cases in science and teaching may profit from using container technology Use cases in research may profit because it helps to, to reduce some of the problems I talked about. Um, use cases in teaching can greatly profit. We already did this and the students are very, very happy again with what we did um, to, to try out new stuff and, and yeah, I talked about that. Um, and uh, setting up such a cluster to, to do uh, cool stuff uh, in, in, in science and teaching is easy in the beginning but we have seen, uh, at least in some, in some examples, where, after, where you, after the installation, need to draw decisions. And these decisions are not easy. And you need to think a lot about how you do stuff, because otherwise you may run into problems. The whole area, for example, of how to do properly the storage, which I just quickly talked about. We could fill maybe a complete talk with just talking about how do you do that, right? And so this is questions that Obviously, any user who wants to implement something like this must answer on their own. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really um, things where, where uh, you don't say anymore, yeah, just execute this command and it works. So our first, uh, uh, no, sorry, it is important to understand how this works to not only rely on some script that is given to you or some magical Kubernetes command, which does things in, in a certain way. Uh, you should be able to understand at least at a basic level how things work. 
and document what you have done. Our first experiences show that we are on a good path, but um, uh, we need more time to evaluate our setup. So maybe in the future I can give you uh, even more uh, in-depth in, um, in, in depth analysis of uh, what things worked out good, what things I would change. So especially the question about how to build this multi-tenant cluster is uh, different to a lot of other use cases of Kubernetes. And so there is a lot of tutorials how to do this if you just want a single tenant cluster. And there's areas where you need to real, uh, really make a difference uh, to this tutorials is usually not so good covered in, in the documentation of the, um, of the different tools that you might use. And so, uh, yeah, we, we hope to provide an even more in-depth analysis of, of uh, our own setup in the future. And maybe we can even do a talk or workshop next year to, to uh, report on the progress. But uh, right now, I hope I have given you at least an impression of why it is an interesting topic to look how these tools can work in, in the, at the university. And um, I hope you have understood uh, what are the motivations behind this. And yeah, for, for more, we can have a, maybe a workshop or something like that in the future. So thank you very much. Here's some contact information and I'm happy to receive your questions. Hello? Oh, yeah. It works. So, yeah. Mm, thank you for your talk. Um, I found it quite interesting. I just want to uh, ask you if you can give some, uh, some uh, uh, things about the, th the size of the cluster. So how many nodes are there? How many namespaces do you have? And how many people are uh, administrating the cluster? Yeah, right now we are uh, still, as I said, in the process of building this, of, of getting experience. So right now we have uh, we are running this on um, some workstations. So we have five workstations, uh, so basically five nodes, of which one is the master node. And um, some of these nodes contain the storage array. Um, so we have replicated storage already, but we are working on that, as I said. Um, and so right now we don't have such a big hardware setup, but we are right now uh, talking about to to get a real cluster for this with like uh, nodes with I don't know 64 cores and and you know the totally different area of, of computer um, and uh, so that that is the plan to really do it on a big scale and so this will make a difference and uh, obviously it is not okay if you have only one person administrating this I think your, your question of how many people do this is related to that so um, right now it is mainly me and some student assistants who are working on that. But uh, we are totally clear that once we say on our own that we have found our setup, which is reliable, which is working, that we bring in other people and we have a lot of other people in our department which are quite interested. And then we already have an agreement that from each uh, project group, for example, there's one person who will be sort of an administrator, at least for this area. And so that is the idea of how we want to do this. I would like to understand a bit better uh, what type of tasks run on your cluster. Uh, is it mostly um, CPU-wise challenging? Is it I.O.-wise challenging? Do you have tasks which need for example, GPUs instead of CPUs? Is it possible to do that from inside containers? Do you have applications which would like to do MPI and stuff? Would you call it an HPC cluster in the end? And yeah. what is the average usage? Is it, is it full all the time or not? So, so basically, everything of what you said could be the case. So our different projects are very different when it comes to the computing requirements that they carry. So typically we have stuff that requires a lot of CPU power, so really number crunching stuff, and um, typically also a lot of memory because you need to do some machine learning, whatever, and you want to do it in the memory um, whenever you can, right? So that is 
I would say, a typical uh, use case. But also we have applications which have really huge databases, which obviously not fit in the memory. So we want to have a proper storage uh, which is uh, attached to the cluster. And um, if you were asking about GPUs, we're not doing much with GPUs in our department, but for other people this might be the case. Uh, I cannot um, talk in detail about this because I don't know about it, but I read that recently Google started to offer also Kubernetes um, nodes which have GPU assistance, and they also are integrating this in this quota management, so they are supporting this. But how you do it exactly, I cannot tell, because for us it's not relevant. So for us, mainly it's number crunching, it's lots of memory for, for you know, in-memory analysis uh, jobs. And, and sometimes we have larger databases, but we're not very in the, in the area of, of big data as such. Thank you. Uh, yes, I want, uh, would like to know if you have a documentation, how you deployed this kind of um, infrastructure. Yeah, so as I, as I already said, we have um, accepted the fact that without a proper documentation, this is worthless. So we are documenting stuff. Right now we do this in our internal Git repository, but we are absolutely thinking about um, doing this in a public way on GitHub or wherever. Um, so this is... Um, Absolutely. So, so if we have a chance to give something back to other people who want to, to do the same stuff or something very similar, uh, we always try to do this because for, for me as a person who is basically paid on tax money, this is always the motivation to do uh, whenever I can to, to provide the results of my work in an open way. So I, I want to do this and right now... I, I will be honest, I'm, we were not in the state where we can clearly say, okay, this is how we want to do this. We are still experimenting. We have good initial results, but we're still experimenting. And later on, maybe next year or sometime, we may put this on, on GitHub or whatever. Um, thanks for the talk. Did you ever consider using OpenShift, OpenShift instead of uh, Kubernetes? Um, I read a lot about OpenShift. Um, but, um, well, I had some initial experience with Kubernetes. That was basically the, the motivation why I said to my student assistants, let's do it with Kubernetes. So it's always, I think it's, it's always a benefit if you already have some prior knowledge. But I think, in, in theory, you could do it with OpenShift, totally. Um, did you experience any problems with Docker itself? Like uh, any bugs in Docker? Is it mature enough? Uh, not any bugs with Docker itself, but we quickly discovered that Kubernetes is quite picky when it comes to using the wrong Docker version. Uh, some people are nodding. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so at some point we had um, a bit uh, over-motivated uh, automatic update on one of our nodes, which put the Docker to the new version. And then Kubernetes basically said, what's that? I cannot work with that Docker version. I don't know what the reasons for that are, but that is basically something that we experience. But any sort that Docker itself had a, a problem, uh, I cannot remember, no. Any further questions? Um, so, how do you uh, propose to manage um, credentials um, if you set up uh, systems? Uh, especially if you put it in some Git repository, which is pretty much public inside your organization or even totally public. Yeah, we would not put any passwords or something like that in the Git repository. Um, there are many other ways to do this properly. Um, we, we make use of, of uh, password stores for that, but um, I already encountered, so the password stores then on, on some computer where you SSH to, and then you have you know to enter a passphrase to open it and, and stuff like that. That's maybe not the best way to do it. So there are more elegant ways to do it in a distributed way, but we haven't really uh, put much um, thought into it yet. Uh, but clearly, it is, it is clear that we do not, uh, you know, save passwords and clear text in the Git or whatever. Um, and um, within Kubernetes, you can have these um, secrets. So you can save confidential data in Kubernetes. Obviously, then you need to trust the system, right? Uh, but if you don't trust the system, you better not use it. 
so, so um, for example, the, the, the passwords for um, that Kubernetes itself uses, for example, to access a private, uh, private um, Docker registry are saved as a secret in, in the Kubernetes management plane. Right, so, um, and they are encrypted in some way. I cannot tell you how it is done in, in practice, but that's also a part of the system, obviously, that the people who write the software think about uh, these use cases. Um, and what about the, the user credentials? I think at the university you have a central user management, LDAP, Kerberos things, and uh, is, will this be integrated to your platform? Yeah, this question is right now, I cannot give you an answer to this. Obviously, this would be uh, beneficial uh, to, to use the account that's already there. But for talking to the Kubernetes API, you need uh, to have some, some uh, secret key. And so basically, you, would, you uh, provide to the users the, the configuration with the secret key inside. And so I do not know how this works if you use LDAP with a user and password login. Um, but if there is any way to do this and it is properly secured, then yeah, this is of course an option. So when people already have the account and can authenticate to some system, why not use it? Any further questions? Yeah. So um, to this uh, question, uh, can do you use a dashboard for login for this for students or have an SSH login? Uh, so, so you you don't need to log in to the actual cluster nodes. You okay. only talk to the Kubernetes API. Um, you you have the API um, and you have the kubectl command oh, okay. line thing, and everything talks to this API. Right. So, so whenever you want to change the configuration or something like that, you you use kubectl. And oh, okay. you can do it on your local computer, and then obviously you need to have access to the API. Um, and right now, the access to the API is restricted for the people who are inside our subnet. But yeah, that's also something we need to work on. Um, how do you get access, uh, in, in which ways, but that's basically the, the idea. Yeah, but this uh, dashboard this has a lot of features also for uh, creating. Uh, you you mean the official Kubernetes yes. dashboard? Yeah, we don't use that at all. Oh, okay. So, so we have a um, for for monitoring, for example, we have InfluxDB and Grafana stack, um, and we uh, and, and use these uh, node exporter and stuff that Google has built to to export the metrics, um, and uh, the other features. I, I don't even know um, until yet they were not relevant for us. All questions answered? Well, then, let's thank you again for your talk. Very inspiring. And thank you.